Today, I would like to tell you a story. It's a story about numbers, about mathematics, but it's also a very human story. A story that makes us ask questions about what does it mean to be human? What can we know? What is beyond the limits of what we can know? And perhaps even a story that make us ask questions about faith and God. Now, the story is going to begin with numbers, but don't be scared off. I know you may not think of yourself as a math person. You may be a little bit intimidated by numbers, but I want to tell you that you were born to do mathematics. I know you may not believe that, but it's true, and I can demonstrate it with just a few dots. You ask, what do these dots have to do with anything? Well, you look at these dots, and just by looking at them, you know that there are three dots there. But it's not just that you know that today. It's that from the moment you were born, you knew that there were three dots here. That is, even as a newborn baby, you're able to recognize number in the world. Of course, as an infant, you can't raise your hand and go, three, you haven't learned the language of number yet, but you recognize threeness. We know this because we do tests with babies and, and we see that they can tell the difference between three dots and four dots. They can recognize number. From the time that you were born, you were counting. And, and, and indeed, historically, as a, as, a, as a species, humanity developed the notion of number by, by counting. How many goats do you have? I need to be able to distinguish if I have three goats or if I have four goats, right? Or maybe seven goats, maybe a whole lot of goats, right? But, but then we develop some richer notions of number. Maybe I want some way to communicate, you owe me some goats. Oh, this isn't going to do. I can't just have one, two, three, four. If you owe me goats, it's going to introduce some negative numbers. So over time, we came up with richer notions of numbers, not just, not just one, two, three, but we started thinking of numbers as living on a line, a line that traveled indefinitely far in each direction. There's no limit to how many goats we could have. One, two, three, four, but in the other direction, negatives. Negative one, negative two, negative three, negative four, and so on. We also developed some, some ideas of fractions. Maybe, maybe not with goats so often, we don't often talk about half a goat, but in doing things like building, constructing, figuring out taxes, payments that are due, fractions become really useful. And so we want to be able to do things like, like here, right between one and two is one and a half or three halves or, or all these various fractions that fill up these spaces. Now, there's one number I've left off because it took quite a while for us to come and embrace it. And that is the number zero. You may find it surprising that such a simple number caused so much controversy, but people were very reluctant to embrace zero as a number. After all, what does it mean to have zero goats? How can you count nothing, right? You have no goats, it's not zero goats. What does zero goats even mean? And so theologians and philosophers have spent a whole lot of time talking about nothing. And, and you can cue into some of those conversations if you'd like. But let us continue thinking about something. We're going to allow zero. We're going to have these numbers. And then as you know, as the history of mathematics developed, we started discovering some other interesting numbers along this line. Numbers that couldn't be written as a fraction. It can't be written as a fourth or a fifth or 17 eighths. Numbers that we call irrational, like pi. Just a bit more than three. Pi lives here. It's, it's 3.141592653589732384626433832795028. Okay, it keeps going and going. You get the idea, right? It, it's never ending in its decimal expansion, not repeating. It's, it's this irrational number. 
perhaps you know some other irrational numbers. If you ever had the chance to study calculus, oh, beautiful subject, you would see another irrational number come, a little bit smaller than three. It's, it's called E. It represents the number 2.7182818. Four, five, nine, zero, four, five. It keeps going on and on and on, not repeating, seemingly random, the digits of E proceed. So we have these irrational numbers. And, and then maybe you remember that there are some numbers that are just totally bizarre that don't even live on this line, this real number line. We get some other numbers like, like not even on this line, we get the number I, the imaginary number which represents the square root of negative one. Okay, so we have all of these bizarre numbers, many of them on the line, some even off the line, ma making mathematics a whole lot more complex, right? But, but what is the, the moral of the story? So, so the, the, the Nobel Prize winning physicist, Eugene Wigner, in 1960, wrote a paper where he reflected upon the nature of mathematics. He called that paper the unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics. And in the introduction to the paper, he made an observation. He said, isn't it curious that mathematicians are able to, he said, skirt the domain of permissible reasoning, that, that we exploit all of the tools of reason available to us. We even go to the outer limits of, of what reason allows us to do, to come up with things like not just counting numbers, one, two, three, but negative numbers, zero, these fractions, irrational numbers, imaginary numbers. He says, we're skirting the domain of the impermissible. And then he says, the fact that this does not end up in a morass of contradiction, that this complex reason doesn't just end up in foolishness, he says that is a miracle in itself. A dozen times in this paper, he'll use the word miracle to describe mathematics, its consistency and application to the world. He's using this religious language because it says there's a profound mystery going on here. He then goes on to comment. He says, certainly, it is hard to believe that our reasoning powers were brought to the perfection that they seem to, 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 to exhibit by Darwin's process of natural selection alone. That is, he's saying, if we're just cosmic accidents, it's, it's very difficult to, to understand why it is that we're able to do mathematics. Why is our reasoning so well refined? And, and it's not just that, that we can do mathematics and doesn't end up in contradiction, but that it's, it's, it's beautiful and consistent. It's, it's, well, let me give you an example. Let me give you an example of this so you can get a, a sense of, of what Wigner is talking about. You see, we develop all these numbers and ideas from different areas of math. Pi, that comes from geometry, right? Thinking about circles. E, that's, that's analysis, this, this branch calculus, this other branch of mathematics. Imaginary numbers, that's looking, solving, finding solutions to polynomials, roots of polynomials. We have all these different pieces from these different areas of mathematics, us chasing down different lines of reasoning. But then we discover that they come together in this beautiful way. The Swiss mathematician Euler discovered that these numbers fit together like pieces of a puzzle. In particular, he found that E raised to the power of I, the imaginary number, times pi plus one is equal to zero. Take a moment and appreciate that. This, this symphony of mathematics all coming together in this, this beautiful, this beautiful singular equation. This is considered the most beautiful equation in mathematics. And we've done studies that show that the mathematician, when, when she looks at this equation, the emotional center of her brain lights up. Just, just like how when you hear a great piece of music or see a beautiful sunset or an incredible painting, how it evokes an emotional response. For the mathematician too, this evokes an emotional response response. Why? 
because it's so surprising, so elegant, so beautiful. These different pieces coming and fitting together almost as if it had been waiting for us to find it, to discover it. And so Vigno says, what is going on here? What is it? Why is that instead of falling into contradiction, we end up with something so beautiful? But Vigno's paper goes on to make a number of other observations about the miraculous nature of mathematics. It's not just the consistency of mathematics, it's its applicability. The full title of the paper is The Unreasonable Effectiveness of Mathematics in the Natural Sciences. Vigno is particularly interested in how mathematics, something that's purely an exercise of human thought, of, of me going into my office, writing on the, on the blackboard, not thinking about the world around me, just doing math. I think these ideas are beautiful, so I'm chasing them. I think they're elegant. I think there's something here. So, so I'm, I'm pursuing it. And yet, the mathematics we develop, simply for the sake of developing mathematics, turns out to be exactly the language we need to make sense of the world around us. Take a moment to appreciate that. It's, it's, it's like, it's, it's, what is going on here? It's not just that, that we have this language. I mean, it begins with the fact that we can even begin to make sense of the universe at all. So Einstein, he put it this way. He said, the, the most incomprehensible thing about the universe is that it is comprehensible. And not just comprehensible, but that we can comprehend it mathematically. See, imagine, imagine a dog sitting in a library. Now, that dog was just blissfully going through life, doing whatever dogs do, totally unaware that around him are these volumes of incredible knowledge. The dog does not know. The dog cannot know. The dog's mind is not built to be able to read and understand those books. And yet, we find ourselves in this privileged position where we can go out and we can open the books of the cosmos and we can read the deep structure of the universe around it. And those books are written in the language of mathematics that we can begin to make sense of the world in some incredible and some deep ways. So time and time again, Wigner refers to this as miracle. He's using religious language, and I think he's doing it for a good reason. You see, under naturalism, under the view that there's no purpose behind us, but we're just here as a cosmic accident, that, well, that under that view, it really is unreasonable for mathematics to make sense like this. But if you're willing to, to embrace is Christian theistic view of the world. If you're willing to embrace the doctrine of creation that says there is a mind behind it all. It makes sense that there's order and structure to the universe because there was one who ordered it and gave structure to it. And it makes sense that we can begin to understand that order and structure because we ourselves have been made in the divine likeness. That the one who painted the universe with beauty the, the one who gave it his structure gave us similar minds and go out in pursuit of truth and beauty. And then we we'll discover these true and beautiful things that come and harmonize deeply and give us some deep insights to the world around us. In fact, it's that Christian conviction that we can make sense of the universe because there's a mind behind it whose likeness we are made in. That was the foundation for modern science. If you go back and you look at the pioneers of modern science, they were driven by this conviction. Now, now I've been raising these issues of, of doctrine and creation and, and theology in the Bible, and maybe that raises some really good questions for you. Maybe you're like, but wait a second, I don't know about all that. There's some stuff that, that in Christianity, in the Bible, that it's kind of hard for me to, to, to figure out how that all squares away. I hear you. I get it. And so does Euler, the mathematician who discovered e to the i pi plus one is zero. Euler wrestled with this himself. Euler, after all, was the son of a Christian minister, and he himself had been training to go into ministry before he was called into mathematics instead. But, but as Euler wrestled with this, 
In particular, there was a movement that was happening at his time. Out of France, there was this free thinkers movement, an atheistic movement. They called themselves free thinkers. And, and Euler didn't think that was the best name because they seemed just as dogmatic as anyone else. But, but, but Euler felt that he should respond to some of the questions they were asking. Now, one of the issues they had raised about Christianity and the Bible is the issue of contradictions. They say, go look at the Bible. There are these contradictions in the text. Therefore, give up on it. But, but Euler, he, he was reluctant to embrace that point of view. After all, as, as a responsible scholar, Euler recognized within his own field, mathematics, there were many apparent contradictions he ran up against. Let me, let me give you one example of, of something, a, a type of contradiction in mathematics. We could do some very deep and profound ones, but, but I'm just going to do a simple one for you. Let's just use the numbers 0 and 1. None of the irrationals, nothing, nothing complicated, just 0 and 1. What could go wrong with those? Okay, let's begin by saying 1 equals 1. Innocent statement, nothing wrong with no contradiction. One equals one. Great. We could build on that though and say one equals one plus zero. Certainly true. Let's add another zero. One equals one plus zero plus zero. Still true. And you can keep adding zeros to one side. So we could say one equals one plus zero plus zero plus zero. Zero, 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 and definitely many zeros added on to the end of that. Fine, no problem. But now we're going to make a move. Notice, each time I write a zero, zero is secretly the same thing as minus one plus one. Yeah, each time you write zero, we can think of that zero as minus one plus one. So now instead of having 1 plus 0 plus 0 plus 0 plus 0 plus 0, on and on and on, we instead get 1 plus minus 1 plus 1 plus minus 1 plus 1 plus minus 1 plus 1, on and on and on and on. But did you hear what that was? Did you catch it? We have 1 plus minus 1 plus 1 plus minus 1 plus 1. That's the same thing as if we group them, shift over the grouping, that's the same thing as 1 plus minus 1, plus 1 plus minus 1, plus 1 plus minus 1. But each 1 plus minus 1 is just 0. So we end up with just 0 plus 0 plus 0 plus 0 plus 0 plus 0 plus 0. What is this? This is just zero. We ended up with one is equal to zero. Now that's a contradiction. Something should not be equal to nothing. I mean, that's what something even, even upset the theologians and philosophers, right? How could one be equal to zero? But here, here's Euler's point in all of this. Euler is pointing out that in mathematics, when you run up against problems like this, your response shouldn't be to throw your hands up in defeat and say, ah, oh, mathematics must be wrong. Let me abandon mathematics. No, your response should be, let's wrestle with this. Let's, let's engage this. Let's see what's going on here. Maybe you can figure it out today. Maybe it'll take you a week. Maybe it'll take you a month. Maybe you'll go your whole lifetime and you'll still be wrestling with it. But he says, engage that wrestling. Don't give up on mathematics. Dive into these apparent contradictions and see what they can teach you. Then Euler's point. In his response to the free thinkers, he writes this in, in a pamphlet called In Defense of the Revelation. He says, take the same approach with faith. Yeah, there may be some teachings or some points of tension as you read the Bible, as you think about the teachings of Christianity, but, but those points of tension, don't, don't let that make you throw out the whole thing. Then mathematics, we're going to throw out this, this beautiful EDI pi plus one, you're going to throw out all that beautiful truth because of points of tension. No, 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 no. There's so many good reasons to hold on to it. So hold on to your faith, 
but engage those apparent contradictions. Engage those points of tension and let them drive you deeper and deeper into the thing so you can better understand and wrestle with mathematics or in the life of faith, your faith in God. What happens when you begin to dive in here? Well, we won't have time for a full explanation, but maybe you see what's going on behind the scenes of this paradox with apparently one equals zero. You see, it's not just a paradox about one and zero. There's another concept lurking behind the scenes, and that is the infinite. We were trying to add zero infinitely many times. If there's one thing that modern mathematics has taught us, it's taught us how to wrestle with infinity, how, how to really dive in and try to make sense of the infinite. And, and the more we do this, and the more in my own mathematics I wrestle with this idea of the infinite, let me tell you, my heart is awakened in it a desire for eternity. I desire this idea of eternity. It's just, if mathematics, the number line, it's inexhaustible. There are so many new treasures to be discovered here. There's so much more than that we've come to describe yet. We're going to need eternity to exhaust this thing. I desire eternity to study mathematics, but I also desire for an eternity to wrestle with and come to know the heart of God. Come to know God's incredible love for us as displayed in Christ. One of my favorite books, Education, in the final chapter, opens with a quote. It says, Heaven is a school. Its field of study, the universe. Its teacher, the infinite one. The life of faith means that we can have hope for an eternity of wrestling, not just with mathematics and the other beautiful subjects that you study, but an eternity of coming to know the heart of God.